Hi everybody, welcome back to IndyCar. It's uh, the 25th, I think, today of November. And you know me, I've always got to check this stuff out. Yeah, the 25th today, sorry, oh, of November. Okay, uh, today's subject is the Tory Manifesto, or rather the lack of a Tory Manifesto, really. Um, having read through the main points of it, I think there's 13 of them, most of it is pretty underwhelming stuff, really. Things like they're not going to raise your taxes. Wow, big deal that is. They're not going to cut them either. And they're not going to raise your national insurance. Well, again, wow. What, what else are they not going to do? They're, they're not going to increase uh, student fees in England, so they're going to stay exactly the same. They're, basically, it's a manifesto full of things they're not going to do. And to me, it strikes uh, a worrying call that really what they're concentrating on doing is keeping a tight ship, as somebody said recently. They just want to keep everything the same as it is at the moment. No, no let up in austerity, really. The idea is really just to keep everybody under the thumb, get this vote done, hopefully win the election, and press on to their ultimate goal of finally getting this uh, European uh, Union exit deal uh, ratified by Parliament and get the thing off, finally off the ground after four years of faffing around. But, you know, Brexit, as you know, even even if you get this done, uh, it's just uh, setting the firing, firing the, the starting pistol again for another round of delays because we know that there's only one year to do the negotiations of the trade deal and we know that it took Canada seven years to get their Canada-style trade deal and we've only got a seventh of that time, which means that almost guarantee that Boris is going to have to ask for another extension, but this time to the... Um, uh, what do they call it, the transition phase. So, again, we're going to be watching Brexit unfold in slow motion for the next two decades under the Tories, uh, while austerity continues unabated, really, and that, that's the size of it. That's what um, what the Tories are offering Britain at the moment, in general. Uh, the, the Lib Dems are offering to stop Brexit in a way that <clears throat> they can't seem to describe, uh, and in a way which is anti-democratic, because you can't just... Uh, completely rubbish the vote of the entire United Kingdom, which was taken three years ago to leave the EU, uh, without having another uh, vote of some kind, because you, you, she can't just, you know, Joe Swenson says she's going to revoke Article 50, but how can she do that? She hasn't got a mandate to do it for a start. So it's not likely that any of that will happen, and looking at the way the Tories are behaving at the moment leads me to believe that the the whole of the United Kingdom really is just having to put up with the Tories. This this business of trusting politicians and the fact that the BBC is now editing out the nasty bits uh, which are embarrassing to the Prime Minister or make him look foolish really just proves the point that the BBC is there um, to do the PR work for Boris Johnson. And basically that's all it is now. The, the, the British uh, state broadcaster is now the PR department for Boris Johnson and the Conservative Party. In the meantime, we've got Tony Blair wading into things as well uh, and being berated for uh, his lies in leading us into a catastrophic war in Iraq. So, I mean, everybody seems to have an opinion on what, what should happen and what shouldn't happen. And then today we've had, uh, what's his name, Richard Leonard, the almost unknown uh, Labour leader in Scotland, pontificating about how he, uh, if, if there's a Labour government in, uh, in Parliament in the next year or two, that if the SNP were to win another majority in Holyrood in the 2021 uh, elections for the Scottish Parliament, then Labour would condescend to give the Scots uh, an independence referendum. Well, thanks very much, R Richard Leonard, but you're not going to be there to give us anything because you're about to lose your your seat. Your whole party is about to get wiped out. And I dare say that when it comes to Holyrood uh, gen general elections in 2021, we'll be saying ta-ta to Mr Leonard as well. But anyway, that's, uh, that's really all that's happening at the moment. It's not very much going on other than the Brexit and the general election. But what's interesting, I think, is the fact that people are now openly talking about uh, the SNP not only winning this general election, but the independence movement and the SNP 
wiping out all of the UK parties and coming back with a full set of 59 MPs, none of whom uh, are in uh, UK registered parties. I should say London registered parties, really. And that would be wonderful. Imagine, imagine the state of affairs where every Scottish MP is a pro-independence MP. How difficult is that going to make it for uh, the parties in Westminster when you've got 59 uh, SNP MPs all wanting to speak, all wanting to argue the toss? Now, one of the interesting things that's been pointed out in the last few days by a number of people, actually, is the fact that because the United Kingdom doesn't have a written constitution, uh, it means that virtually anything goes, and it also means that anything that the British government decides to do can also be challenged, particularly in the high courts. Now, we also have found out since Joanna Cherry stopped abrogation of Parliament for five weeks that Boris Johnson was planning by using not the English High Court, but the Scottish High Court, the Court of Session in our house, the highest court in Scotland, to say that it was illegal for Boris Johnson to prorogue Parliament for that length of time. And that was then uh, rubber stamped by the so-called British High Court, in other words the English High Court, also said the same thing, that the Scottish judge's view was the correct one and wouldn't they wouldn't countermand it. Now that sets a precedent for all kinds of things, but the most interesting thing of all is that should it come to the, the point, say, next year, after we've had this referendum, uh, sorry, after we've had this general election, if we did return, you know, 56, 57, or even the full 59 MPs as SNP, it would put us in a great position not only to hold the, the, the referendum for independence next year, but also to argue for it with English voters. You know, to be seen in the, the Palace of Westminster, SNP, uh, MP standing up and saying how Scotland being independent will benefit England because England will be able to do so much more because they won't have to so-called support Scotland. Uh, we, they won't have us, you know, with the, the cap out begging for money from them as they think we do. And all of this, the, the sudden realisation of what Scotland actually does for England will, will finally hit home. But aside from that, it also means that English voters will see that all of Scotland now has rejected unionism. If every constituency rejects UK parties, what does that tell voters in England? It tells them that every Scottish constituency has both rejected Brexit and rejected Great Britain. And I think that is probably one of the most remarkable things that we could achieve during this, uh, this next um, election. If we can wipe the floor and wipe out all of the UK parties across Scotland, completely obliterate them, eradicate them totally from every corner of Scotland, that would send a fantastic message, not just to the people of Scotland that they're now free of this corrosive, Brexit-obsessed, uh, London-centric group of MPs who, who want nothing more than to keep the gravy train running for themselves, and have replaced them with people who are deliberately going down to Westminster to demand our, our exit from the UK and to make sure that we get that Section 30 order. Even if we don't, then the referendum will still go ahead because the law is being created in Scotland to have a referendum like this. And as we now know, Scottish law, once it is enacted and once judges have made their judgments on it, cannot be overruled by English law. And that means that if we hold a legal referendum, which is entirely legal and legitimate under Scottish law, then the English High Court dare not go against that judgment. If the United Kingdom government decided that that wasn't good enough and they were going to still hold it and not recognise it, then you could take it uh, to the International uh, Court in The Hague, where huge class actions like this would take place, where one country is basically saying to another, you can't behave like this. And judges at The Hague are independent of these countries. They can make these judgments uh, from the position of simply looking at the case law and looking at the laws of those lands. Remember when, um, when the uh, Pan Am bombers were tried? They were tried at The Hague 
And they weren't tried under European law or even English law. They were tried under Scots law because the crime was committed over Scottish soil. And that Scots law meant that Scots judges sat in that court in The Hague and made that decision. Now this is a very interesting point that Scots law can operate anywhere. It can operate here, it can operate in England, it can operate in Ireland, it can operate in the European Union, it can operate anywhere in the world as long as whatever it is that we're being, that they're discussing happened in Scotland. In the case of a referendum where we have a majority voting for independence then I think that's classified as probably one of the most important issues to be judged that has ever been for Scotland. And for for us, if we win this uh, referendum next year, and I anticipate that we'll win it by a goodly margin actually, but when we do, and when the British state decides it's going to play hardball and not cooperate, not recognise the new Scottish state, we have got all of the, the European Union to trade with which is worth more than four times the entire British supposed internal market of the UK. We'll be quite happy. Scotland will be able to carry on as if nothing had happened. We won't need to buy anything from England at all. In fact, quite the reverse. In fact, I believe England is going to need a lot more of our electricity, our water, our gas, our oil, all kinds of stuff that we've got that they don't have at the moment or they have in short supply. It's not going to be Scotland uh, where the lights go out and it's not going to be Scotland which is desperate for a trade deal with England. It's going to be the other way around. So when people say to you Scotland doesn't have any power here, England holds all the cards, they don't. They hold all the political cards or they think they do but the fact that they never bothered to write a constitution in England is their own fault and it now means that Scottish law when it comes into force next year, in fact at the end of this year, will allow us to have a referendum and leave the UK whether or not the Tories like it and whether or not a section 30 order is forthcoming or not. We're really only asking them for the section 30 order out of politeness and courtesy to try and involve them in the process so that they feel that they've been informed about it and that they've had some role in it um, in both helping to facilitate it and to recognise whatever the result is. But we know they're not going to do that. We know that they're not going to, uh, to give a Section 30 order. And we've heard from Richard Leonard that the only way he'd give a Section 30 order, or, or if Jeremy Corbyn would, uh, is if the SNP were to win another majority in two years' time. I mean, what? Richard Leonard's got absolutely no power to make that kind of offer whatsoever. And it's unlikely that Corbyn will actually win anyway. I actually have a sneaking suspicion, and this would be hilarious if it happened. It might not happen, but imagine if it did. Imagine if Johnson, Swinson and Corbyn lost their seats. Just imagine the chaos if every leader of those three English parties didn't win their own constituencies. Now apparently there is a risk at the moment that Johnson might lose his seat. There is a very, very strong likelihood that Joe Swinson will lose hers. I'm not sure about Jeremy Corbyn, but you never know. What a laugh it would be if all three of those parties' leaders lost their seats. We'd have a whole new ballgame, we'd have a whole new series of three new leaders to contend with whilst the Brexit chaos continues. Meanwhile in Scotland things would carry on smoothly because we would have 27 other states to trade with and we would continue to trade with them. And we would do a trade deal with them very quickly because we're already members of the EU and we don't plan to leave anyway. That's about it from me today, but just remember that there are, nobody is safe anymore and the, the normal rules of politics uh, have been destroyed in recent years by these disruptors, Donald Trump, uh, by, by Boris Johnson, by, by Putin as well, by Netanyahu, all this group of powerful men who are just trying to shake up world politics at the moment, all of these so-called power players that have basically thrown the chips up in the air and just let them fall where they may. Anything can happen. Leaders can be unseated, underdogs can win, the most unlikely things that we ever thought possible have already happened. So who's to say that all three UK leaders might not lose their own seats? 
I think that would be absolutely brilliant to see. Imagine that if all three of them were voted out <laughs> by their own constituents and somebody else was voted in. It would be very funny. And um, not that I think Jeremy Corbyn will win this general election, but who knows? I mean, anything can happen. This is We're so far down the rabbit hole in politics nowadays that I no longer uh, think that there are certain things that won't happen. There are obviously things that will definitely happen. But uh, three UK party leaders losing their seats in the one general election would be some kind of a record, I think. Anyway, my, uh, my aim is really for Scotland to rid itself of every uh, London registered party MP. Labour, Tory, Liberal Democrat. The Brexit party's dead anyway. UKIP's gone, thank goodness for that. And I think that horrible man, what's his name, the, the UKIP MEP, David something or other, he's gone as well, he's retiring, he's not standing again. Uh, so, it's all changed. I can't wait to vote, actually. People who are wandering around going, I don't know who to vote for, what the hell are they thinking? Of course you should know who to vote for. Vote for the SNP. Let's wipe them out in the whole of Scotland. Let's do the old roundup. Get the weed killer out and basically get rid of all these political weeds from our garden. Let's see the rest of Scotland bloom for a change without these people dragging the country down constantly and complaining about how bad it is. It's not the Scottish people who make the country bad. It's English mismanagement of Scotland that makes Scotland bad. We've got our own government, and our own government is, at the moment, just trying to stop the mismanagement from England from hurting the most vulnerable people in Scotland. If we had control over everything, then they wouldn't need to do that. Those people would be protected. So just think about that when you're voting. Wouldn't you rather that the people, the most vulnerable people in society, were protected by your own Scottish government, rather than being constantly cut, you know, subject to cuts and horrible treatment by, by Tories and their, their new universal uh, credit, which means that people have to starve for five weeks before they get any money. I mean, what kind of credit system is that? What kind of welfare is that? That could be gone. All you've got to do is vote for the SNP and then vote for independence and all of that is a bad dream, it's history, it's gone. We don't need to worry about that anymore. Anyway, I'm ranting, I'm off. I'll see you all later, have a great day. Bye for now.